So welcome, everyone. And welcome back to most of you. I'm very excited to have you again for sure here tonight. And really, spanning uh, two days of reviews, then a lecture, and then a seminar, probably basically the gamut of what uh, the academic work or output is mm -hmm. great. Helen is an associate professor and centered in critical studies in architecture at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And she's also the director of critical studies in architecture. Her research covers, as most of us you know, of course, um, basically architecture and philosophy of bridges, those two. And that has a background in the fact that she um, did a five year degree program in architecture in Australia before she went on to do a PhD in philosophy, which she finished in, she did in 2004, and that was at the University of Sydney. Um, already before then, in 1995, we um, then started to teach architecture, and basically your work of experience been in an academic context ever since, which led in 2000, and also in 2011, to the uh, tenure position at the RMIT in Melbourne. And then your path went to Stockholm. Um, and the position that, or the, the work there has basically uh, that's been so since 2012. She is currently on a sabbatical, and that means that she resides in Lima, not far from here, and that is in order to um, conduct research and write. Um, your edited books include um, Deleuze and Architecture, that came out on Edinburgh University Press in 2013, Designing Design, Cartographies of Theory and Practice, which was an excellent book in 2015. The in the city in 2016, sorry, that was 2015, the Nurse in the city 2016, and architecture, architecture and feminists, ecologists, economists, and technologists, and that is in press in the Yeah, in September. No, November, November. <laughs> Your own books, fully also by Ruben, um, is How to Make Yourself a Feminist Design Powerful. And your sabbatical involves um, the preparation of the work and the writing of creative ecologies of practice. And that is um, forthcoming in 2018 when you um, in London. A quick look at the uh, writing and work is impressive in its very erudite involvement with contemporary references and the broad scope of thematic concerns. That means she engage, engages with ideas and expected culprits, if I may say so. Um, <laughs> you forget the start to die, for instance, it's good enough to monitor that down. I know it is. Not the least, of course, for those who are tired. However, she also situates her work in the broader intellectual context, with which her ideas emerge with the freshness. But I believe we are in dire need of, and that also serves obviously architecture both on an intellectual and theoretical level, and also in a practical sense, through loosely feeding our respective design paradigms. And I think we know that also how that works loosely in having a very good for two days yes. in reviews. Specifically, and um, abstract for the it's is on the, on the wall in front of you, um, the studies of objects in a philosophical sense in architecture is one of the things that we have access today. It has been addressed in various academic contexts, not the least in the US, and continues to be a difficult and also most engaging conceptual problem for architectural design. Your being here today and then, um, promises to be of help in uh, grappling with questions about architecture, architectural form in a wider social and cultural context. And I imagine, just like I mentioned at the beginning, that you bridge to this wider 
uh, output, but also a laser smooth figure as a direct or indirect critical and intellectual extension of the discussions we've had over the past two days, as much as anticipating the seminar tomorrow. Mm. Please join me in welcoming the Well, I just want to thank Johan so much for such a kind and generous introduction, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and it's been uh, great to experience um, many of your work uh, in the midst of you know, unfolding. It's, it's a real pleasure. So thank you to you all. Okay. I'm going to stand, because I, I need to stand up, otherwise I'm going to you know, slink into a seat. So drawing on the various turns in architectural theory toward affect, new materialism, speculative realism, as well as acknowledging the general crisis, environmental, econo economic, socio-political, as a backdrop to our contemporary matters of care, I will discuss three quasi-architectural projects today, which I'll characterise in relation to post-human landscapes, things and thinkables. Part of my aim will also to be uh, to undertake a, a quiet critique, or not so quiet, of um, the recently branded and rather too popular object-oriented ontology or object-oriented philosophy associated with uh, such names as the philosopher Graham Harmon and also with the literary theorist Timothy Morton, who's better known for his concept of the hyper-object, also ecology without nature. And I'll do this by framing these three key concepts or concept tools, post-human landscapes, things and thinkables. So what is a post-human landscape and what is its relation to things and thinkables? While it might be tempting to conflate a post-human landscape with the cinematographic dramas and depictions of post-apocalyptic scenes with which we are so familiar, where the earth has been rendered near uninhabitable and humankind has been reduced to the last survivors, the scenes of which I speak are often far more banal. Instead, a post-human landscape draws critical attention to the milieu, both social and environmental, in which we already find ourselves practically embedded and embodied. From amidst this material milieu, I propose that today we are obliged to rethink what it is to be human and what this means with respect to the architectures we erect and maintain. Furthermore, the post-human landscape and the demand that it places on us to question our assumptions about human exceptionalism cannot be extracted from the things and the thinkables in which we're embroiled. Where the thing turns out to be not so inert as we may have imagined, the thinkable is a shock to thought aroused in an encounter with post-human landscapes and things. So together, post-human landscapes, things and thinkables are bound into complex relations of a life setting up a background of possibility for exploring and undertaking a critique from within our contemporary architectures and environment worlds. So in what follows, again, I'm going to present three projects located on a spectrum between art and architecture. And I'll discuss these in terms of these three conceptual constructions, post-human landscapes, things and thinkables. Now, when I speak of concepts here, I do not intend fixed ideas, but rather something like concept tools with which we might, uh, which we might deploy in order to make sense of and with things that confront us. This means that the concept tool must be adapted to use to our specific problems, but we also have to be wary of breaking it, because the concept tool should also be something that's generously held out and passed on to those who follow us or with whom we work. Now the post-human is not the demise of the human being, as it might sound, though species extinction is something that we should be taking seriously. The post-human is a demand to rethink and reposition our presumed exceptionalism as humans. In 1999, N. Catherine Hales, well known for her book, How We Became Post-Human, explains that the post-human is not that which comes after the human. It's not some kind of apocalyptic break. Instead, it's more about an overlapping between innovation and replication. It's a thought image with which we can reconsider the human. 
but not the liberal human subject as independent and sovereign. And Catherine Howes in particular is interested in human machine interconnectivity and interface. She's interested in how we construct memory through new technologies and even how our very embodiment becomes problematized. Her key, key themes engage with globalization, the performativities of the human machine interface, also questions of virtual embodiment via algorithmic perceptions. More recently, Rosie Bray Dotty also takes on the figure of the post-human, again to challenge assumptions about what we think the basic human, uh, the basic unit for the thinking human subject might be. She challenges a default uh, assumption that we make that uh, the human is something very Vitruvian, male, white, centered, sovereign, and so forth. Instead, she wants to speak to something of a nature-culture continuum She's interested in the self-organizing force of living matter in different permutations of subjectivity and in an, affirm an affirmation of the present and a kind of a, 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 a retort to the gloomy images um, that we're faced with. She wants to maintain something of an optimism. She suggests the post-human helps us to rethink what has come to be called the Anthropocene which, and I quote her, is the historical moment when the human has become a geological force capable of affecting all life on this planet, unquote. And finally, she is in fact interested in saving the humanities as a, as a disciplinary field. Also the figure of the intellectual toward forms of common matters of concern and care toward different forms of gathering and building community. She's interested in radical relationality. So you see across both of these thinkers, their definitions of the post-human become quite specific. Now, I would add to this that the post-human, as some form of figure, cannot be extracted from its situation, its location, its embeddedness in relations, in what I've called post-human landscapes. So now I want to open with something of a prelude and my little animation to go with it. I want to open with a prelude, another image altogether, one with which I'll assume that many of you are, are probably familiar because it was used as a key advertising trope for last year's Venice Biennale of Architecture. When referred to at all and not simply taken as a branding tool, the image was simply called that lady on a ladder. You might have even wondered what she was doing there, because it would appear that she was not apprehending anything that could be easily identified as architecture in the conventional sense. So why was she to be spotted all over Venice on ferry stops, on billboards, at the airport? She will help me further establish the background to my discussion and the first key concept tool, which is also a field of operation, the post-human landscape. And so I draw to your attention this woman standing on a ladder in what appears to be a dry, deserted landscape. Let's put her there. At first glance, we assume that she is a woman because she's wearing a skirt that gently billows in a distant breeze. Her hair is held up and she has her back to us. She stands somewhat precariously atop her aluminium ladder. She is looking out at a vast, uninhabited landscape, looking for something. Is she looking toward the past or toward the future? She could be the last modest witness of the after effects of a devastating event of global reach. Or else she could be documenting an ancient prehistoric site and its curious markings. Her name is Maria Reich. She is a mathematician and an anthropologist. And like an architect, she knows how to document and to draw. In fact, she is looking out over the ancient landscape of the Pampas in Peru. in order to compose a drawn record of a 2,000 year old large scale land tracing known as the Nazca Lines. These ancient landscape markings compose geometric forms that beg decryption and a bestiary of animals including a guano bird, a spider monkey, a dog and a hummingbird and so forth. Let's see if we can see an image of the landscapes, it's a bit blurry here. It's the essayist and travel writer Bruce Chatwin who introduces Maria Reich to the world when he writes an article about his encounter with her in the Sunday Times in the 70s. 
She had been occupying the Peruvian landscape for some 40 years, since 1932, dedicated to this particular practice of hers, of, of tracing the landscape. Maria Reich had taken it upon herself to measure and trace these ancient Nazca lines in order to determine whether their arrangement was coordinated with the movement of the planets, the cyclical passing of the seasons, the winter and summer solstices. The Nazca lines, in fact, um, cover an area of something like 450 square metres, and they're what are called negative geoglyphs. They're shallow trenches made in the ground by removing reddish pebbles, uncovering a whitish greyish earth beneath. Chatwin explains that Maria Reich could add up strings of decimals in her head, and when these got too large, she would make a note of them in the folds of this skirt that's billowing out. On her aluminium ladder, let's put up this one here so you can see it, which she carries around the desert landscape with her, Maria Reich becomes technologically augmented. She's already a post-human in this technological augmentation. She achieves right, just the right amount of distance from the ground while remaining materially attached to it. She's both embedded in the landscape at the same time as able to achieve just the slightest of technological adv advantages to secure this point of view. From this technologically augmented embodied position, she is able to perform what can be called, I would suggest, imminent critique, or critique from within the situation of what I'm calling a post-human landscape. Now, as some of, you, as, of some, as some of you might know, certainly anyone who's gone to the Venice Biennale last year, Maria has been appropriated by the curator, the Chilean architect, Alejandro Aravena, as his mascot, his aesthetic figure, through which I argue he's trying to produce certain effects and effects. When you open the Venice Biennale of Architecture 2016 website, or when you collect your catalogue, guide, and other paraphernalia, you catch sight of Maria on her ladder. Immediately on entering the Giardini exhibition, you enter into Maria Wright's room. And Aravina has some interesting reasons for using her. He wants to draw out certain lessons that I think are interesting for architects to consider. In the first instance, he points out that Maria demonstrates inventiveness in the face of scarcity. She has scarce resources and must make do with her simple ladder technology to gain a point of view over the landscape, which would otherwise remain a meaningless dry plain full of incomprehensible clusters of stone and gravel. So the lesson for architects here that we can extrapolate is how to use scarce resources and minimal means to produce nevertheless great outcomes. Aravena also points out that her response to the landscape is what he calls pertinent. She challenges an abundance of technologies that she might have used. For instance, it might have been convenient to drive around the landscape on a truck and put her ladder on top of it to get an even better point of view and greater mobility. But she's realised, of course, that to undertake that engagement with technology would qu quickly destroy the fragile ground that she's trying to document. So here then the lesson for architects that I believe Aravena is trying to draw out is how to pay close attention to your sites of engagement, not to destroy them before you've even begun. Now my question though in terms of Maria is um, the way in which she seems to witness the exhaustion of worlds past and present. Where after all have the ancient Peruvians gone? How finally will humankind disappear? And what material signs will they leave in their aftermath? If we pause to imaginatively project into a future, what will some alien other witness when humankind has been all but erased from the face of the earth and the world historical scene of the Anthropos has all but faded from view? Maria could be looking toward the future or the past. She stands there for my purposes as a figure confronting what has come to be called as I've defined earlier, the Anthropocene. Now we are told by anyone from geologists and political scientists and atmospheric chemists to cultural studies theorists and feminists and philosophers of science that what an imaginary future alien other would bear witness to is what has come to be called the Anthropocene, Athro Anthropocene, where the Anthropos draws attention to a privileged unit, that of the man, and the scene to a very long span of time. But we can also hear in scene, in this neologism, 
uh, something of a scene that we're playing our own part across, our own contemporary world historical scene. Donna Haraway too has a, a, a helpful um, definition of the Anthropocene from her recent book, Staying with the Trouble. I'm not gonna read this out, but what I'm gonna do now is pass from the post-human landscape into this question of things. And now I'm gonna start taking us through the three projects that I'll address today. What kind of things do we discover and construct across these anthropo anthropocenic scenes? Isabel Stengers, the philosopher of science, points out that certainly the meditative question, what is a thing, or the evocation of the thingness of things, and here she's making a sly aside to Martin Heidegger's notion of the thingness of things. These have an enticing philosophical flavor when we hesitate to ask about them. Now a great deal has been said about things, as it turns out, from a diversity of situations and disciplinary points of view. Distinctions between things and objects have been ventured or overlooked. A life of things has been called upon or else an orientation toward objects has been recommended by such people as Harmon. An engagement with things and objects has been uh, stated as a cure to human finitude. The thing in itself, in some instances, seems to remain inaccessible, but things continue to bother us. A thing is a being in itself, as self-contained, a realised object that simply contrasts with a properly human being for itself, which in turn is ever in tension with a being for others, as Sartre has described. There are things in themselves, or noumena, and things for us. More recently, things turn out to have a power all of their own, a thing power. And things rendered as hyper-objects have been inflated into objects of such massive environmental scale that they are loco located beyond our meagre human ken, except for the symptoms and signs that we can meagerly glean. There is a social life of things commented, commented upon and questioned. Things are set out as boundary objects, said to mark out thresholds between one state and the next. Things are slippery and become something rather like quasi-objects, changing guard with quasi-subjects, because subject and object are flung together and intermixed into temporal flows and upheavals. We momentarily gather around a thing to argue about our matters of concern, what we share, what we disagree about, what we agree upon. Young girls are offered example, as examples of sweet young things, Martin Heidegger. Live human subjects are, with historical regularity, reduced to bare life and rendered as exceptional things to be prepared for sacrifice. Things, it probably goes without saying, have a long conceptual history, a long and an illustrious genealogy that divides and endlessly subdivides down so many tributaries of thought. And we find also in the um, series of any conferences that were taking place just prior to the turn of the millennium with a, with a special conference and issue dedicated to anything. And that's where Elizabeth Gross's um, essay comes from. But let's move on to this first project in this meditation on things. What is this thing, seemingly without an identifiable scale, that adorns the cover of this special English language edition of Arc Plus, Journal of Architecture and Urbanism? It could be a meteorite, it could be a stone dug up from the ground, it could be one of Maria's stones writ large. It even resembles a piece of chewed up and spat out gum, but it's not. While it looks like a natural found object, perhaps, it is in fact, a manufactured object reproduced by means of uh, iterations of models, sophisticated digital scanning, and 3D printing. It composed the central installation featured in Venice Biennale's 2016 Swiss Pavilion. This craggy rock and grotto is called Incidental Space, and it is signed by the architect Christian Carres. We see it under construction here. Now, Anne Ling Nyo, editor of the special issue of Arc Plus, describes this grotto rock as alien, exalted, inscrutable. That is to say, it seems to be withdrawn. It's inaccessible to signification. It's only available, available perhaps, to the senses. 
It's also worth noting here that the kind of uh, rock grotto-like feel of it, so let's see if we can, um, you get the sense of its interior as being something of a grotto in these slides. It's worth noting here also that grotto can be related to the grotesque, that which arouses a mixture of both wonder and horror. Ngo fiercely uh, defends Carez, who has apparently been critiqued for his lack of responsivity to Alejandro Aravena's brief, which is directed at social architectures for the 2016 Venice Biennale. This grotto thing has seemingly challenged the brief by arousing instead a kind of sensual pleasure and alluring its audience instead to kind of enter its interior and so forth. Now in his editorial, um, Ngo specifically focuses on this question of things. And he draws attention in the first instance to Bruno Latour, yet another theorist, uh, social scientist. Um, Bruno Latour's introduction to the large edited volume with Peter Weibel, who I think going to give, has given a lecture here in the past. Um, their large co-edited volume, Making Things Public Atmospheres of Democracy where the thing for Latour is defined as that thing around which human and non-human actors form a gathering. Responding to some event, responding to some matter of concern, responding to a question or a problem or something that's bothering them. Latour's discussion of things is re rehearsed, in fact, in an earlier essay called Why, Why Critique Has Run Out of Steam, From Matters of Fact to Matters of Concern. And this essay, when you look right down the bottom, you'll see is dedicated, as it turns out, to Graham Harmon. In this essay, he gives us a definition also drawing on Martin Heidegger, who seems to be one of these sort of um, primary philosophers of the thing. He writes, Martin Heidegger, as every philosopher knows, has meditated many times on the ancient etymology, the origin of the word thing. We are now all aware that in all European languages, including Russian, I'm quoting Latour here, right? There is a strong connection between the words for thing and a quasi-judiciary assembly. Icelanders boast of having the oldest parliament, which they call Alting. And you can still visit, in many Scandinavian countries, assembly places that are designated by the word ding or thing. It's also interesting to think of the last two days that we've spent here in a form of jury, a review, where we've gathered around various things to kind of voice our shared questions and perhaps some of our shared matters of concern. Certainly this would appear to be a rather idiosyncratic and yet deeply interesting definition of a thing. Not something that's mute, but bound up in politics. Not something that's separate from human affairs, but entangled in their concerns. Not isolated, but operating in animated relations. Not withdrawn, but something with which we're deeply engaged. Now, returning to incidental space, once further investigation is undertaken and one reads reviews of Carreza's thing, in Dazine, for instance, where the thing is called an inhabitable cloud-like structure, or descriptions by the curator Sandra Hay, who, and I'm probably mispronouncing her name, who insists that Carreza's thing stands only for itself, something of a thing in itself, with no references to an outside, somewhat withdrawn, stating what's more that it does not illustrate anything, it does not make reference to anything, but is an architectural and technical experiment specific to this event. Or we can look to accounts by Mario Carpo of The Thing, historian of the digital, who very much enjoys how Carreza's thing shifts in scale from the size of a shoebox to a gallery room, relishing the unknown origin of the thing. What is it after all? What does it come from? Finally, it would seem that no Latour-like politics of gathering is aroused. Instead, the thing withdraws into the mystery of its elaborate production and its pleasure in the incidental, something of a merely sensual object. But we know this is not the case because further reading also reveals that it is a very specifically technical process and problem that has been uh, you know, generated, worked on with students. So students have definitely gathered around it as a, as a thing of concern in order to assist in its production. It also needs to be noted, here's a couple more. 
It should also be noted that um, Carreza's thing, Incidental Space, was accompanied by another work in the central pavilion of the Giardini, dedicated to favelas, where much early exploration has been undertaken by one of his PhD students, Hugo Carnario Leo de Mesquita. You have to um, forgive my pronunciation. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, Carreza is designing a 450 unit social housing project, Pareo Police, in which, he says, each apartment is unique. That is to say, each one works on a certain pleasure in the incidental or in happen happenstance spaces that appear in slum architectures, that emerge out of slum architectures. His ambition is that Paris or police will be unlike similar housing projects built in the 1970s and 80s, which are just boxes stacked on top of each other. I'm quoting him. Something curious begins to happen between the work on favelas and the work on this object that's meant to be somewhat inscrutable, this thing. You could even suggest that there's something of an analogical correspondence that could be made between the projects, one that seems to have something of a, a social engagement and one that seems to sit there for our pleasure, to inhabit it as a grotto. Certainly both perhaps risk somewhat of an overemphasis on formal experimentation, typology and so forth, over a consideration of the socio-political but uh, there's a procedure that both are sharing in terms of raising up incidental and happenstance spaces. This is something that they share and celebrate. Now, again, if we look further through this edition of Arc Plus, we find a further essay. Inside the same volume, there is to be found an excerpt from Timothy Morton's book Hyperobject, Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World, which addresses things writ large, that is, things the size of the environment, and things as difficult to grasp as global warming, biosphere, climate, evolution, and also capitalism. Morton has a definition of things, or rather objects, quite distinct from Bruno Latour's discussion of political gatherings around matters of concern. Morton instead, in his direction, follows the philosopher Graham Harmon and the increasing popularity of object-oriented ontology or object-oriented philosophy, as it's referred to now. With Morton's conceptual invention of the hyper-object, which is supposed to alert us to a mesh that inheres between objects, and here subjects too are included under this heading of objects, so human subjects are objects, Morton proposes that he is opening up a point of view on things that has otherwise been occluded or obscured uh, by our fixation on terms such as world, nature, and environment. He's coining a concept, something of a concept tool, in the hopes that we might see things, or rather objects, differently. And yet it is important that we neither see objects in process, so these objects for Morton are not in process or in formation, they're not in relation but they're distinct, circumscribed and withdrawn, and writ at a very large scale. For Morton, there is no environment, there is no nature, there is no world. There are only these hyper-objects that we are unable to grasp, and things, such as Carreza's incidental space, must be apprehended as altogether weird and mysterious, scintillating in their allure, as we, the onlooker, are rendered somewhat stupefied or, or stupid even. Now I want to continue this approach to strange objects and things that stand for nothing but themselves, whose origins are ambiguous, things that withdraw from us as we are supposed to withdraw from each other, whose scale remains ambiguous, things that even suggest the intimation of environment worlds without humans, or something like post-human landscapes or more than human landscapes. And this will lead me on to the second project, Between 2009 and early 2011, at a women-only show called Elles at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, a small section of the exhibition was dedicated to female architects. In a glass vitrine clustered amidst the other exhibits, a model of ambiguous scale, yet again, represented a sample of computationally generated architectures from file to fabrication. It was composed of a delicate, elusively biological curlicues set against something of a textured, arid ground. Though a comparison here to Maria Wright's 
arid landscapes would be ill-advised. When apprehended at this delicate scale enclosed in a glass vitrine, the model is maintained as something of a na nature mort, a still life or life stilled. It is impossible to know how large it should be or whether, much like Perez's incidental space, it should simply be apprehended as an aesthetic wonder in its own right, referring to nothing outside of itself. Certainly it functions in much the same way through formal experimental uh, procedures. It is itself and nothing else beyond a registration of the potentiality of the chain from file to fabrication. It's a wonder. The project in question is Alyssa Andrasek's probiotics agent wear. And the name of her studio is fortuitous given the topic of my lecture. It is called Bio Thing. The conjunction bio thing is that thing which acknowledges the strange biological liveness of things, challenging the presumed threshold between the living and the non-living. If a thing is supposed to be inanimate, mere stuff, then a bio thing radically contravenes this limit of the living and the unliving. And we had best acknowledge its thing power. What's more, we have the emergence of what Andrasek calls computational ecologies in which the thing emerges. Computational ecologies populated by multi-agent systems creating com complex webs of relationality and a computational capacity, and I quote her, to descend into the cellular grain of matter, flow of light, heat, vapour and friction. Architects, she claims, can now go beyond geometry to directly design the structure of matter itself. And this matter turns out to be quite lively. All of this uh, is achieved, and I quote her again, through algorithmic, process-centred, data-rich and iterative processes um, enabled through technological advances that are increasingly eroding the difference between, she claims, the artificial and the natural, tempting designers to embrace the mode of operation which is suggestively similar to that of biology in the natural world, unquote. And the experiments are fascinating, they're compelling, effervescent in their aesthetics, elusively lively. They seem to swarm like germs in a petri dish before our eyes. And in fact, on her website, we often see those kinds of animations of these, these things in process. Biothing, in the early days, begins with forms of experimental algorithmic poetry, as we see in this essay from Neil Leach and others' um, book, uh, Digital Tectonics, from 2004. And then the research and practice of Alyssa Andrasek gradually develops. Um, now we'll find her in journals, peer-reviewed journals like Intelligent Building International, and she's currently a reader at the Bartlett. But what further interests me in a reading of these really alluring and also, of course, the, the, the technologies and the process behind them are fascinating. What interests me is a small note, an aside that Andrasek makes in an essay in Log Magazine 26 in 2012, where she discusses the benefits of what she calls object-oriented programming, about which I'm sure there are many people here who know more than me. So they'll be, you'll be able to correct me. This is a computational process which allows for the distributed independence of discrete units of data, of cellular automata and multi-agent systems toward the simulation and increased discretization of building blocks as an alternative, she suggests, to procedural programming. So she's describing some of her programming softwares and procedures and these shift in, in, in programming means. And of course, it's, it's uh, this lovely serendipitous similarity because object-oriented programming shares the same acronym as object-oriented philosophy. And in note six of uh, Log 26, in her essay, Open Synthesis Toward a Resilient Fabric of Architecture, she in fa fact directly suggests a comparison between object-oriented programming with Graham Harmon's object-oriented um, philosophy, explaining that object-oriented philosophy, as proposed by Graham Harmon, considers the life of things as grounds for a new metaphysics. But this begs the question, what is this object-oriented ontology? Or rather philosophy, as the name of this paradigm has shifted. 
Like something of a theoretical virus in its own right, it's spread across the annals of architectural discourse. We find it discussed or cited in Log, specifically in two articles of Log 33, 2014, where um, in one, uh, an argument for object-oriented, for, uh, an argument is stated by one of the, um, uh, the figures in dialogue with Graham Harmon that now is the right t time is right for an object-oriented philosophy exhibition. You know, we've taken it up so fully into our discourse that now we need an exhibition dedicated to it. We also find it in this edition of Arc Plus in relation to Timothy Morton. And um, I don't know whether it's going ahead, but it, it looks like possibly Edinburgh University Press will be starting a series a bit like Thinkers for Architects, for Architects where they'll commence with object-oriented ontology and Graham and Harmon's work and introduce it to architects. So it's, it's kind of, you know, en vogue at the moment. But when we turn to a reading of Graham Harmon, what we find is, and I'm going to sort of just list the qualities, uh, the, the characteristics of his philosophy, it's a sort of brief summary. It's a realist philosophy of the autonomy of all things, where objects, not actors or agents, withdraw and are inaccessible. They cannot be explained by overarching systems, what he calls overmining, nor can they be reduced to smaller and smaller parts or atoms, which he calls undermining. They stand in something of a middle ground, and it's tempting to see this middle ground as corresponding quite accurately to a human scale. But at the same time, they refuse the privileging of the human because they're calling on a flat ontology, an equal relation between humans and non-humans. Harmon's objects, as it turned out, are split into two and then four. They're real, but their reality is inaccessible to us. They're sensual, which means that they do elusively and phenomenologically arouse us and allure us. And yet at the same time, they're non-relational and anti-materialist. They're deeply anti-materialist. They are also, when you read across various of the essays where Graham Harmon is featured and in his books, they're stridently anti-political. They don't have a political or social project. There's no gathering here. There's no matter of concern. Harmon's aim, he states, is to overthrow epistemology or a study of knowledge in favour of aesthetics. This would seem a little bit interesting for architects. We need to have a good you know, theory of aesthetics after all. And I've heard him myself publicly calling himself a, phenomen a, phenom a phenomenologist. In all, this means that something of the project, I would argue, risks returning us to a conservative um, turn in architecture toward phenomenology, where also, and we see this in his dialogue with Todd Gannon, David Rui, and Tom Wiscombe, we have a return to master narratives and a return to masterpieces, which are taken to be goods in architecture, things to be valued. Now, once we kind of analyse his arguments in this cursory way that I've given here, in fact, and we interrogate them, they bear very little resemblance to the argument that Andrasek is otherwise making about the benefits of object-oriented programming with its distinctly manageable, if complex, dynamics, which is certainly not withdrawn and inaccessible, rather, and it's not about objects, it's about agents operating in layered fields of data-driven relations. And these, these agents, furthermore, they do divide into smaller and smaller parts, right down into the kind of, you know, the matter that she says architects can engage with. And at the same time, they're also organised through overarching universal systems, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, which further purport, in fact, to be political, or at least social in their potential engagement with the public, because... Like another lovely, lo lovely virus, dead and alive at the same time, the experiments of BioThing eventually escaped this petri dish and leapt out of the vitrine and arrived in the public sphere with the 2012 Project Blue, which was rolled out for the 2012 Olympic Games, commissioned as part of a series called the Wonder Series. Here is an experiment, um, Andrasek explains, in the universal applicability uh, uh, achieved through the mass variation of a particular cell a method of responding to specific situations by deploying this universal code that's sort of manifested in these discrete parts. The architectures of BioThing thereby enter into relations with children, students, researchers, expressing a desire to form human and non-human connections and curious artificial natures. 
They operate as something, and she explains, they can operate as urban toys, uh, they produce a distributed urban game, and the outcomes of their recombinations tend to be emergent and unexpected. They also have a pedagogical content. They enable children, students, and so forth to develop an intuitive knowledge of rule-based systems or code in the recombinations that you can participate in producing. They also uh, sort of teach a sort of intuitive response to notions of vector machines. And they apply something of a universal system of these components that can be applied and adapted to different contexts. Now this leads me to the, the final project, which shares some resemblance, I would say. But it's even harder to categorize because it, probably, it belongs, uh, I suppose, more rightly in the field of art and art practice. Also mathematics and geometry. From 2005 onwards, coordinated as an astonishing matrix of connections around urgent matters of care pertaining to imperiled oceanic environments, specifically the bleaching of coral reefs, a collective of 8,000 people, mostly women, across 27 countries incrementally began crocheting an enormous distributed coral reef out of yarn, plastic, trash that they'd uh, harvested from their everyday lives. They were led by two Australian sisters, Christine and Margaret Wertheim, who'd moved to Los Angeles. Christine is a poet, an artist and a crafter, and Margaret is a science writer, a mathematician and a physicist. This globally distributed handcrafted exercise is based on a geometric model of hyperbolic planes. What is a hyperbolic plane? Well, it is a figure that is said to have contributed to the inauguration of non-Euclidean geometry, or geometry after Euclid. As the mathematician David Henderson explains in dialogue with uh, one of the sisters, one way of understanding it is that it's the geometric opposite of a sphere. On a sphere, the surface curves away on itself and is closed. A hyperbolic plane is a surface in which the space curves, oh, excuse me, on a sphere, the surface curves in on itself and is closed. A hyperbolic plane is a surface in, is a surface in which the space curves away from itself at every point. Like a Euclidean plane is open and infinite, but it has a more complex and counterintuitive geometry. The philosopher of science Donna Haraway, who I've cited earlier, also tells the story of this collective enterprise, which mixes the complex geometry of hyperbolic planes with the fiber craft of crochet, and importantly, an ecological matter of care concerning, to these, concerning these oceanic environments. In her recent book, Staying with the Trouble, Haraway suggests that the Wertheim Sisters Coral Reef Project is the world's largest collaborative art project. The aim of this distributed project is to embody material contact with coral reefs via material play through crochet. But this is meant to be a practice of intimacy without proximity. That is importantly, you engage with the question of the coral reef without having to visit it, because in visiting it, of course, you're risking destroying the environment further. Instead, material play builds caring publics, Haraway argues. And so there are certain learnings that, are be, that can be made from this collab vast collaborative project of kind of making and complex geometries. There's the longevity of the project, that, it, that, it's, that it's been going at least since 2004. There's the collective expression of the project, that it's uh, produced many satellite events, it's, it's distributed itself. It also employs transdisciplinary mixed methods across science, philosophy, the spatial arts, and these fiber arts of crochet and crafting. It also has a pedagogical aspect to it and a shared ethos. It teaches people to understand complex geometries as well as engage in uh, challenged environments. It gathers people around matters of care, things that they should, might be caring about. It performs an ethics of care. What the material player producing an artificial nature, a natural artifice, um, achieves is a, again this collapse of a distinction between nature and culture, producing something of a, a continuum. 
It also offers a provocation to thought to address a deep entanglement that we have with our environment worlds, both close at hand and further away. It offers a kind of material thinking in the act of crocheting or in the act of making, whereby, in effect, you become part of a coral network of relations. Haraway goes so far as to say we are all corals now. So I've proposed it produces some kind of, uh, you know, shakes us up in terms of our thinking about, um, about environments, about post-human landscapes specifically. And now I want to conclude just briefly with this curious term, this notion of the thinkable, because it calls on us to consider thinking as an activity in a different sort of way as well. I want to conclude now with thinkables, which is to take an adjective, that which is thinkable, and make it into something like a thought which belongs to no one in particular. A thinkable, and this might sound counterintuitive, is independent of either a given thinker or an object of thought, though it does circulate between both in the midst of an event or a taking place. It is less the thought I have than the thought that strikes me, coming from elsewhere, emerging in the midst of an encounter. A thinkable does not belong to me, rather, as Isabel Stengers remarks, the challenge is to transform processes of thinking into forms of adventure. And she says, if there is a subject who thinks, it is rather the unfolding of the drama itself, the event within which we find ourselves. And this can turn the thinker in either, to a, in either a larva ready to develop into another form of life or into prey. That is to say, when you suffer a shock to thought, The thinkable embeds a potential in you as a subject in formation, or else it can take advantage of you and turn it in you into its prey. Turn the thinkable into something that's a dogmatic ideology. With respect to thinkables, there's always a problem that re requires the production of a thinkable. It's always about addressing a pressing problem. It becomes a speculative gesture, an imperative that Isabel Senegers and Vincent Dupre call out, and the imperative is think we must in our various engagements with our contemporary environment worlds, amidst these general crises with which I've opened. Likewise, we can ask how this thinking situates us in relation to our architectural project problems. Which problems, after all, are the most pressing? Which problems matter? What is sufficient to make us think and think differently? What is sufficient to make stir a thinkable that might shift entrenched habits and material practices in architecture as elsewhere, so as to enable us to ameliorate our environment worlds? Haraway argues it matters what thought thinks thoughts, and it is a material practice. So what I've done is I've sketched out three projects that relate to things. And I'm not really going to compare them, I'm just placing them alongside each other and we might take them on as part of our discussion. In a way, I'm creating congruities much in, uh, in the manner that you have done across your various things that you compile together, creating aggregations and concretions and seeing what happens in their relation with each other. I don't want to judge one project as better or worse than the other, but kind of begin to understand what each draws out, what, what, how we're provoked to think in our engagement with them. Thank you very much.